Hi, everyone, and welcome to this very special episode of the Negotiation Podcast. This episode is number 100, an incredible milestone achievement that we are excited to celebrate with you, our listeners, without whom we could not have come so far. We humbly thank everyone who listens, as well as all the guests whose knowledge and expertise have been the backbone of the last two years' worth of work, helping us create content that serves as a bridge to cultural understanding between the West and the East. Thank you to our guests, thank you to our listeners, and thank you to everyone behind the scenes who helps put this show together every week, and we look forward to what the next 100 will bring us. We are excited to bring you not one but two guests for this special episode. Our first guest is His Excellency Dominic Barton, Ambassador of Canada to the People's Republic of China. Our abridged discussion covers topics like major trends he's witnessed in his 20 years in China, lessons the West could learn from China's drastic growth over the past two decades, and discuss Ambassador Barton's book China Vignettes and the main takeaways from it. We then welcome back Sarah Kudalekos, the COO and Executive Director at the Canada-China Business Council. We discuss China's most promising business sectors, how business relationships have changed between the West and China, whether China has an emerging issue of too many white-collar professionals and not enough blue-collar, and lastly, some interesting pivots that have taken place in response to the pandemic. Enjoy. The more connected China is from a transportation point of view, the more that will enable growth. If you look out at the 2035 notion of what they want to do, some of the ambitions are setting, you know, one, two, three, which is like one hour maximum amount of time to travel between one end of a major city to the other end. Two being the maximum hours between any major city in China, that's the maximum amount of time it should take. And then three being the amount of time in hours, three hours between a, any major Chinese city. What that does to productivity, what that does to growth is pretty significant and that that i think we'll see continuing home to over 4 billion people the asia pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users it's a market no globally minded brand should ignore but entering markets like china is no easy task just ask the likes of microsoft google uber and facebook Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies enter the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technology. Ambassador Barton, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Todd. It's a it's an honor to be on on your show, and look look forward to the conversation. We are tremendously excited to have you join us on this very special episode, celebrating our 100th episode of the Negotiation Podcast. I'm particularly excited for this conversation because not only are you Canada's chief diplomat in the People's Republic of China and a steward of Canada's relationship with China, but in your previous life, you spent close to 20 years working for McKinsey, where I know that you had a focus on China, first as the chairman of Asia for the firm, and then as global managing director between 2009 and 2018 when China was in the midst of its rise. So if you don't mind, indulge us. Talk to us about your first visit to China. What was that experience like and what were your impressions of the country when you were there for the first time? You know, my, my first visit actually was as a tourist and I, I was, I'd been living in Seoul and Korea and it wasn't sort of like in the early, early days, if you will, of the, this, the kind of re-rise of of China. It was actually in 1998. Mm. And so that wasn't that early, if you will. But it, I went because it, as a tourist and we went to Beijing and I was, uh, I didn't know that much about China. Uh, but what struck me then was just, it was like a construction site. Beijing was basically a construction site. There were just tons of bicycles everywhere, cars, mm -hmm. chaos, dust. Uh, but just, a, like a flurry of, of activity. Um, and uh, so that, that was my, my kind of first impression. Remember that I'm, I I'm really remember that it was, I can't, cause we arrived in the evening and, you know, construction was going on at, you know, 11 o'clock at night. I think it was a Friday night. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, is 
kind of par for the course, as we know, to kind of the productivity and intensity of the work ethic and so forth, but just tons of construction bikes um, and this kind of mixture of the kind of the old and the new, if you will, um, coming in. So that, that, that was my first impression. Right. I had similar, when I first arrived to China, I thought I need to be in the crane business. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. You have had a front row seat to the economic growth and development of the APAC region since the 90s, with a particular focus on China beginning shortly after that. Can you talk a little bit about some of the major trends you've witnessed in China over the past 15 years? And then on top of that, perhaps, what lessons can the rest of the world learn from that growth and those changes? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I'd say a couple of things uh, on this. First, in terms of, uh, you know, the on the trends, one one comment on the trends per se is that they've been very constant. I mean, one thing that I look back on presentations that I gave in 2003, because I, I lived in Shanghai from 2003 to 2009 when I was doing the, the chairman role for Asia. I wanted to be based out of the mainland. And, um, you know, we would talk about the fundamental drivers of, of uh, what, what is happening in China. And those have, those have, they've stayed the course on, they haven't changed. And, and I believe, by the way, they're going to continue at least until 2030. And those drivers are uh, one urbanization. You know, this, this is a country that has been very rural um, and is becoming much more of a, you know, the, the move to the cities and that we can talk more about that, but that urbanization, I think has been one of the biggest flywheels or conveyor belts of growing middle class, if you will. And that movement of people moving from rural areas to the cities happens come hell or high water. Um, you, you can look at even during SARS, uh, in the early two thousands, the great financial crisis in 2000 and, uh, eight, 2009, you just had this continual flow of, of people com coming into the cities, roughly 18 to 20 million. It depended on the year, but it was minimum that. And, and China today is still only 60% urbanized. You compare that to a place like the United States or Japan, where you see a number more in the 80 level. There's a long way to go on that. So one is urbanization the growth of cities. And now we're going to see megalopolises, right? These sort of clusters of cities. So urbanization, uh, fundamental. No, number two is this uh, related to it, but focus on infrastructure and logistics. Um, the, a real sense of the more connected China is from a transportation point of view, the more that will enable growth. And I think a lot of people... Uh, you know, uh, overplay the view of white elephants and you, how many airports can you have and how many fast train sites. I, I actually think it's been pivotal and is, and there's still a long ways to go on that too. In the growth model is this logistics infrastructure that's being built that is incredible. And you even see, if you look out at the 2035 um, notion of what they want to do. Some of the ambitions are setting, you know, one, two, three, which is like one hour maximum amount of time to travel between one end of a major city to the other end, you know, Beijing, that could probably take two and a half to three hours today. Um, two being the maximum hours between any major city in China, that's the maximum amount of time it should take. And then three being the, the amount, amount of time in hours, three hours between a, any major Chinese city and ASEAN uh, cities there. And I think what that does to productivity, what that does to growth is pretty significant. And that, that I think, you know, we'll see continuing. A third trend is just this almost obsession I would have on education um, and, you know, trying to improve human capital. Um, and that, that, you know, has been going on for, a long time. Um, I think that's that, that in particular, I, I sort of think about in the early 1980s with some of the World Bank work, but this real focus on educating the broader population, ensuring that the uh, tertiary education is has an ambition to be the best in the world. And we're seeing that 
happening before our eyes um, with with Chinese universities on that front. So education has been uh, fundamental uh, on it. And then I think the fourth has been this the, the sort of the technocracy, the the regulatory growth models, the five year plans that we talk about, but the kind of the management, if I could say, may not sound like a trend, but it's a, I actually think it is because it's a it's a capability in terms of how cities get built, how provinces develop, um, how priorities get pushed forward. There's a very strong sense and discipline in terms of the time frames and approach that are used to drive that. And the regulation is quite flexible. Um, you know, we see, you know, if you think about the advent of uh, WeChat and Alipay and all of that sort of thing, that that was a pretty big innovation to enable a vast majority of the population that didn't have bank accounts in a sense to be able to get financial access. And obviously there's challenges. We, we know about some of the recent challenges in that front now because they become so significant, but that's pretty bold. I, I don't think you'd see that happening in Canada or in New York or in London uh, or Germany. Um, and that has, that, you know, it's transformed the payment system. So you have this disciplined, open-minded. Again, I'm not trying to sound like it's all fantasy. Like everything works perfectly. It, it doesn't, but there's a discipline in the planning and the uh, sort of regulatory approach that I think has enabled, you know, new companies to form, um, has been able, enabled priorities to be accomplished um, and the measures are put out. So th- those would be kind of four specific trends. And the only thing I would say is that other aspect to point to it is that they this has been constant. They've been doing this for, you know, at least 30 years. In the West, our view of the PRC and and really most other countries is very top down and government focused. However, as someone who has been working in and around China for more than 15 years, you have had the chance to develop meaningful connections with real people and real organizations on the ground. When thinking about China, what are the major trends and factors that you think get forgotten by the West and our media, corporate actors, governments, and citizens? Well, Todd, I think you hit it on the head in, in terms of the introduction. Where you, I, I do think there's too much of a view in the West of treating China like a monolith. It's China. It's the government. And I think we should, when we do that, and we all can, we all tend to, I think, want to simplify stuff as humans. We should think about our own countries, whether that be Canada or the United States. What you know, what is an American? Uh, you know, is is there such a thing, <laughs> a person? Is there a you know, Canadian? We're all different, and I really think that that gets lost uh, in the kind of you know haze of okay, it's China, China Inc. And there's just so much variety and, and, and differences. So number one is let's not think about China as a monolith. It's got, there are so many different layers there. There is the, the government, but even at the, you know, there's the government, there's the people to people ties, there's business ties, there's the consumer, there's the regions. There's so many different layers that I think need to be understood. And then there's the, the people as you were getting to as well, that, um, we need to under understand more. And one thing I've tried to do, I don't think I've done it as well as I could, is, but is is exactly to get, if you can, into understanding people, individuals, what drives people, what are they worried about? What do they think about? What do they not think about? I tried, you know, the, with one book I did on China vignettes that was in my the 2003, 2009 time frame and it was actually to try and get really deep almost anthropological if you will to talk to you know it was 30 different types of job types i guess of people and really understand how they, how people live their lives and and you just see the variety so i don't know if i'm getting at your question but i i just think that the there's a huge amount of variety and differences regionalism even within cities um how that, that we need to have a better understanding of. I, I think in general, we're, we have too weak of an understanding of this country and of the civilization. So you're really hitting on the main threads in the fabric of what this podcast is about, which is 
negotiating the cultural divide between the West and the East so that we start to understand each other better. And from there, we can move forward having better relationships, better business relationships and such. You mentioned your book, The China Vignettes, and it's all about ordinary Chinese citizens and the lives they lead, which is a very interesting lens through which China can be viewed. What were the main insights that you identified when writing that book? Well, I, again, I, it was really with the purpose that I was you know, I felt I was being too economics driven or macro driven. So I would, I would be talking to, you know, American clients or German clients about the opportunity of China and the growth and so forth and not, you know, really thinking deeply enough about the people is what I felt. How, how, what, what is the consumer like and how might that be changing and how does it differ by age and region and job type and all that but i the, sort of to get to your question i I'd, I'd say there were four or five things to, that i sort of took away about it one is just this deep deep focus on education and children um that was fundamental i you know the the importance, almost like in the Maslowian hierarchy of needs, I would, you know, we in the West would probably have food first, and then you kind of go up the triangle. I think in China, it would be education first, and then food, like, you know, and there were stories, I, like people I spoke with, where they sacrificed what they ate to ensure that there was enough money to send um, their child or one of their children to school. Um, so just this intense focus on education and the wanting the children to to do as well as they possibly can um i think the 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 work ethic that's probably people know that but it gets back to what we talked about at the beginning my first impression you know people at friday night at 11 o'clock people were working building buildings and the you know the hours people put in i still see that today i'm visiting I, I like to make sure i go out into the region so out to factories and so forth and you know people are doing 12 hour shifts, uh, six days a week, there, people are working very, very hard. Um, that, 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 that drive, if you will, the, the strength of the family unit. I, I really felt that people, how people cared about their siblings, their parents, the grandparents and the sacrifices that, that people would make for each other, but it's kind of the strength of that, of the family unit that struck me. It's people are, they want to have a better life. I, I guess the last thing I would just say, and I'll shut up on this one is uh, generosity, generosity. Uh, what struck me was in fact, the poorest people that I met with, like I, I would go and visit these families and the poorest people were actually the most general, everyone was generous, but the most generous, I was really shocked by that i remember one case just i was with my son and we were in just outside of chongqing and there was a a rural family that had been moved to an apartment you know and and they were like on the i think it was the 15th floor of this apartment building and they had ducks on the balcony like ducks right that were there and these were obviously very important things and they they killed one of the ducks and and you know cooked the duck for for this visit right and i was sh- I, you know that that was a that's a big part of their well being you know the, these ducks and i remember my son was pretty shocked right because they they killed the ducks they cooked and it was kind of like from the farm to fork type of thing live and didn't have done it in a different way and he didn't want to eat I remember that he'd say, dad, I don't, you know, I don't really, I said, we're going to, you're going to eat everything off. We're going to, we're going to suck on the bones of this thing. If we need to, this is a, but people, I just say this because it was a, it, just the generosity and that of people. And I, and I found that actually throughout people just being uh, generous. I don't, that, that was something that uh, really struck me. You are a thousand percent correct. And That resonates deeply. And I think that's a fantastic story. And thank you so much for sharing. I want to be deeply respectful of your time. And I know that you're a busy guy. So I have one last question. I know that you're a constant learner and you're eager to always learn and improve. Um, And even six, seven years ago, I, I read somewhere that your summer reading list included things like blockchain or reading about Elon Musk. 
for our audience who are eager to learn more and we encourage them to do so to just understand and learn more about the people who have been in China. Who are some of the key thinkers and thought leaders on China and the broader APAC region that you follow? Oh, there's a that's a great question. There's a lot and I would love any ideas. I mean, I read, you know, Bill Bishop, the Sinicism, the, the, the whole range. You know, it, there's a lot of, I think, very good media, if I could call it. It's almost so much that I can't keep up, if you will, of it. But that there's that kind of category. But I also um, I also like reading what novelists are writing about, um, you know, that, that are, that are writing fiction, if you will, but because often that may be a bit, a bit about the reality the biographies. I'm trying to remember with, uh, Laurel in the room, I think it's con K H A N under a red sky. It's just, it's a story of a woman who grew grew up, you know, in, um, I, I better be careful what province it is. So it said, but Shandong province, let's say, I don't know where it was, but she, she was kind of her, she was, she was the breakdown of the one child policy, if you will, and what it was like being a girl in that and, and growing up. And she's now a journalist and it's just an incredible, it's a, again, it's a personal story, um, that, uh, yeah, it's under the red skies. Um, that's the, the one Carolyn Kahn. Um, so those types of books, you know, Hessler stuff on just all his, what he writes about, cause he gets again, very personal. I, I think it's important to get into the personal as opposed to the macro stuff. Cause you can get that in lots of different places. My favorite book, if I could say of literally, I was going to say of all time, maybe is, is getting a bit carried away here, but it's it literally is one of my favorite books is the Ezra Vogel book on, um, Deng Xiaoping and the making of modern China. I mean, I, I think that should be required reading in business schools. Um, because when you just, you read about the, it's, it's not really about, about Deng, but about the strategy of how he opened up. In, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a case study on change management. If you, if you're going to think about changing your company, I'd read that book. Um, so some, there's some the, of the, of the kind of the classic, historians that you know that i think are worth reading right that fairbanks so there's a deep view on uh on that i'm just trying to think of who some of the others so it's sort of a mixture if you will it's kind of historians um it's novelists uh it it it's um there's another person i'm just i think i'm getting alzheimer's here or something like that it's i can just see the book in front of me right now but that is, you know, it, that talks about the, you know, what change looks like for a family, if you, if you will, with the, with what was increased wealth and choice and so forth and what that means. And I'm, I'm, again, forgive me, maybe we can send it to you afterwards. So I can't, but, but you get my point. It's more kind of biographical, personal stories are the ones that I find nourishing. Balance the macro with the micro. That's exactly it. Just, I think we can just get too, too absorbed in the, in the macro. And again, the last, like the reason and I I'm, I'm actually now on another journey of doing the same thing I did on the China vignettes. It's more going to be probably more video based this time, but to make sure that each week, am I talking to real people and in a real way, like a real conversation? And I'm also talking to old friends. You know, one thing I feel very privileged to be because I have a lot of very old friends from being here. You know, I've known for 20 years and even understanding how China's changing to talk to them about what's it personally, it's more intimate, right? Like what's, what's it like now versus five years ago? What, what do you do differently? How do you think about things differently? What do you not talk about that maybe you did talk about or what, do you talk about now that you wish you'd talk about whatever, you know, but getting into the sociology of that. Uh, the China Development Forum has some very good books too on, they've done sort of a version of vignettes, if you will. Lu Mai, um, L-U-M-A-I is the author. I'd highly recommend it again. He's just tried again to get the profiles of people, but back to your theme of balance the macro with the with the micro personal stories. 
Our audience, thank you so much for all that information. I'm sure that they will take advantage of those resources. I thank you for, for everything that you're doing to continue to bridge the, the divide and, and bring our countries closer together. And I thank you very much for helping us celebrate our 100th episode of the Negotiation Podcast and being here today and sharing your stories. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Todd, and congratulations on, on your hundredth, and it's an honor to be involved in this. I, uh, I, re- I, I really appreciate the discussion. Uh, bye for now. Okay, we thank Ambassador Barton for being here today. That was really great. And now we bring in an old friend to the podcast, Sarah Kudalakos, the COO and Executive Director at the Canada-China Business Council. Sarah, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Todd. It's great to be back. You're on the ground speaking to Western organizations every day about China. As we sit here halfway through 2021, how are they feeling about the market in terms of opportunity for their business? And what sectors would you say they are the most excited about? Not all of our members are having a great time in China right now, but I think it's been quite a surprise just how much Canada's exports to China have continued to grow during 2020, throughout the pandemic, and now in 2021. Every month seems to bring new records in Canadian exports. And that's what we really like to see. And what we're seeing aligns with some research we did um, about a year and a half ago that said, if you are aligned with China's policies, which would include things like the five-year plan, increasing consumption for their new economic model, et cetera, then you're probably more excited about the market. So things like automobile, any sort of agri-food, especially if you haven't been impacted by some of the frozen food issues around COVID-19, raw materials, consumer and energy have all been up. So I think those are the the happy places. You know, anything you might put in a consumer's hand is definitely uh, going well. And I'd say for the longer term, financial services. And the big challenge right now is if what you're selling requires you to show up and meet people and develop relationships, that has been definitely stymied by COVID. So things like financial services, China's really opening up its um, um, it's marketed in that sector. But right now, there's not a lot of government to government um, conversation. And so, you know, that might take a little bit longer. But in the longer term, that's also a happy place. In general, you've been observing China for upwards of, of 20 plus years. We learned a lot about that on the first pod. What are the one or two different things that organizations in the West can learn from organizations in China? What insights from the Chinese market have you implemented into your career or your time with CCBC specifically? So I think the thing that has impressed me the most over the years, and I started in Taiwan and then uh, moved over to doing business in mainland China, and it's the ability to turn on a dime that flexibility in business. And I saw this in Taiwan where I was in the computer industry and, you know, people would go from selling hard drives one day to something totally different six months later. And I see this now in China as well. Companies don't get married to a particular business model and they move fast to meet opportunities in the market. And so one of the things we've tried to do at CCBC is to, you know, kind of keep going at that clock speed and to encourage Canadian companies to move faster, to be more aggressive about going after China, because they tend to sometimes be a little bit complacent. And that puts us at a disadvantage versus Americans or Europeans that might be more energetic in the market. Over your time dealing with China, what sort of changes have you seen in the way China's citizens conduct business, you know, especially internally? You know, as the world evolves over the next five to 10 years, do you see further changes in business practices and relationship building coming up? So if we first look at, you know, how people do business, um, the evolution of China from going from basically a black box, you know, you, you don't know anything about it. You don't know anything about the market and turn having turned into a data driven, knowledgeable market uh, is one of the biggest changes I've seen. And it's a long way from my first foray into mainland China in 1996, when I remember I did a, an assignment there in Shanghai for a couple months where we had hired a market research firm, the very first one to start tracking consumers through a survey called Market Mind. And they would go and they would knock on people's doors and try to get 
uh, information about from them about various things. And in our case, what film was in their camera. And prior to that, it was hard to get any longitudinal data. But, you know, then that started to build years of tracking information on things like consumer opinions and actions relative to what I was doing back then, you know, our brand and our products. And we were able to see our share versus our competitors. You know, now that has just blossomed and you can get everything you want in China data wise. Um, and, you know, consumer habits is something that has also really changed. I remember the old stories about, oh, if you need to buy a gift, then, you know, people in Beijing might want something different from people in Guangzhou. There were very sort of regional differences and what they could buy was very restricted. Now the consumer is just really king. Um, and consumers have changed and the way you go after those consumers has changed. Um, and, you know, changes to business practices and relationships. I think one of the things that I've seen happen and will continue to evolve is how you build your team and the availability of talent and the evolution of the education system. I uh, actually went back to a speech that I wrote in 2007, where I talked about the fact that despite the fact that uh, multinationals wanted to downplay expatriates and localized management jobs, they had found that the depth of business sophistication wasn't high enough to allow them to localize fully. Uh, at the time, there was a Rotman School prof who told me that only 10% of the accounting grads in China were qualified to do the work that was needed by multinationals. Now, that has really changed. I think you see most multinationals, well, while they may not localize 100%, it is not that hard to find very good local talent, whether they've been trained abroad or even trained in uh, local universities. And I think that that quality of education that they're getting on the ground is only going to continue to evolve. I know that in the West, we have a bit of a problem where we have an overabundance of white collar and an underabundance or a lack of blue collar, which in varying degrees is impacting the amount of like a housing bubble that we, you know, we're all experiencing because there's just a shortage of supply because not as much is being built because it's harder to find laborers. Cost of goods is, is going up because getting truck drivers um, to deliver things. And stuff. We just, we, we've kind of overshot a little bit on the white collar. Do you think China is experiencing a similar problem? problem. China definitely is experiencing a similar problem. Ching Tian, who runs Educating Girls of Rural China, she told me a couple things that really align with what you're talking about. Uh, number one, how the government policy has really incented people to go to university. So in the 16 years that EGRC has been sending girls from rural China to university, university costs have not actually changed at all even though the cost of living has risen significantly. The government is making it much, much easier for people to go to school. And now even rural kids who live below the poverty line can get loans for university. The other thing that has happened is that every parent wants their child to go to university. Going to a, a college, a dajuan, is not aspirational. And that's been a bit of a challenge for uh, some of the really interesting programs that, that Canada's college system offers. And many of our colleges have actually done very interesting, very innovative programs uh, in China and will continue to do so. And I think with China's government realization that they need those sort of vocational skills, we'll see more and more opportunity there. Who are the thought leaders in China that, that you follow to stay connected? We're really looking to, you know, our, our China thought leaders um, and China watchers to see how they're staying on top and staying in touch with what's going on in the ground in China. Um, and especially how you're staying connected during the pandemic and an inability to travel into and out of the country quite freely. Well, I've got to say, it's very frustrating not to be able to travel to China as someone who, you know, was living there when the pandemic hit and even in a normal year usually goes four times a year. I really feel like I'm missing out on what's happening. But the amazing thing is that there's been this proliferation of media regarding news from China. Um, some, you know, some are people who've left China, but have stayed very well connected. Um, others are still in China. So things like Sub China, which has a whole series of um, written materials and podcasts and events. Uh, Cynicism is written by Bill Bishop, who people call the China Hands, China Hand. And that's a really great um, 
daily summary of news. Uh, a newer one put together by David Barboza, who used to be with The New York Times, is The Wire China, which I'm finding very interesting. They do some original reporting and um, some uh, uh, compilations every, every, every day. And then there are a bunch of providers on the ground in China. One I like to read every day is by a, a company. It's like a policy shop called Trivium. And uh, they, uh, the, their daily newsletters are very fun to read. They're always a little bit cheeky and they provide good information. And actually back to the first recommendation, SubChina, which is uh, you know, largely run by Kaiser Guo and Jeremy Goldcorn, who had lived in China before. Um, Kaiser's been doing this podcast series called China Stories, uh, recognizing that there's so much interesting long form journalism out there on China that most of us don't have time to read that you can just put your earphones in and listen to people read them. Uh, and full disclosure, I've been reading a few of them uh, for this uh, series. And, and you know, I always like hearing stories that I just wouldn't always otherwise have time to read. So lots of information out there. Yeah, Kaiser's stuff is really great. He's incredibly smart, very cerebral. I almost find myself having difficulty trying to keep up. I have to, I feel like I need to pop open my dictionary um, <laughs> repeatedly. I don't know how he reads how much, as much as he does. He's amazing. Thank you very much for, for giving us some insights into how you stay connected with everything going on in China. You first joined our pod February 2020, and that was the height of the lockdowns in China, but before anyone in the West was really aware of what COVID was, and of course, obviously didn't know what the impact would be. Now, here we are 18 months later. What are one or two really interesting and innovative pivots you've seen companies in China and those abroad interacting with the Chinese market implement to deal with the economic effects of the pandemic? Well, let me start first with something I've seen in terms of Chinese companies is given their inability to find new partners uh, by you know taking trips abroad or by foreign companies coming in to meet them, they are definitely relying on the relationships they have. And so all the training we give to our members about how to develop relationships in China uh, really comes to fruition during that. We have a member in um uh, a services field who told me that they got a project during the height of COVID with a partner who basically came out and said to them, maybe you wouldn't be my ideal partner under normal circumstances, but I know you and I can trust you. And that's enough right now because we can't meet anybody else. Um, the other example I would give is for foreign companies. Uh, and the fact that even not being able to travel to China They've been able to take advantage of the growth that has just continued to happen in China, particularly in the consumer space. And it's been so possible to use e-commerce to uh, stay in or even enter in this growing market. And we did a virtual women's mission to China back in March, and many, many of our participants were in the consumer goods space, a lot of beauty and uh, agri-food. And, you know, they can start selling right away if they want to. And that's uh, that's that's pretty neat. And so, you know, it hasn't required anything really magical to implement, just a willingness to say, yeah, China's a market that's that's going to be there for me. And here's how I go after it. Sarah, thank you so much for coming back on the show and giving us your insights. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show, and I hope we get to have you for a third time very soon. Always happy to come back, and congratulations on the 100th episode, Todd. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, Make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.